Hello, welcome. Thank you very much indeed for swinging by. So, I've filmed in hospitals uh, many times. I'm the Thomas Moore. I'm the, the health, corres health correspondent, science correspondent at Sky News, uh, and there were a lot of doctors who would ask me what they should do and should they put a stethoscope around their necks and and I guess the reason is that many people see that as the stereotype doctor the tool that every doctor has but it's very different now uh, we've got virtual reality robotics uh, we've got uh, precision medicine and DNA and also increasingly artificial intelligence We've got here three pioneers in their field uh, who are going to talk about some of the developments in medicine and how they're changing what doctors can do for, for us, I guess. Um, and so starting here, uh, Mr. Awais Gilani, he's a neurosurgeon at Great Ormond Street Hospital, who used virtual reality to successfully separate conjoined twins whose brains were fused together. We've got Harris Schwab, who's leading a revolution in artificial intelligence at Guy's and St. Thomas's Hospital here in London. And on the far side, Professor Sir Peter Donnelly, CEO of Genomics PLC, which is helping us understand what's written in our DNA uh, with a hope that, that we can live longer and, and live healthier. But let's start with you, Aways. Uh, Bernardo and Arthur Lima, three-year-old twins uh, fused at the brain um, and their parents in Brazil were told there was no chance of, of surgery so how were you able to help? Um, it's the story of the Brazilian twins I think was a good example of how technology um, has helped medicine in the past few decades I mean we're extremely fortunate that we live in the UK, we're based here in London, one of the one of the hubs, global hubs of this technology, and we've got the expertise and tools to do this sort of work here, help the children here. What we needed to do was to be able to do this remotely in a in a different continent. And that's where a lot of the technology, the virtual reality platform that we used came in. T t to we did a lot of the simulations. These surgeries can be quite complex with a number of iterative steps and it's, it's quite important to run through the simulations a number of times beforehand so everybody knows what we're doing at which stage. And, and just to interrupt, I mean, normally you would just look at MRI scans and CT scans of, of the brain and those are brilliant. They take almost like bread slices through the brain and, and give you a very good idea what's going on all the way through but they're still two-dimensional aren't they? And if you've got very complex structures such as a fused brain uh, then that can be quite difficult for you to envisage how you'll physically tackle the surgery. Abs absolutely. I mean, w with conjoined twins, what you have is two brains twisted around each other. So the anatomy is very complex. And to understand that in your head, which is typically what surgeons would have to do, even for experienced people can be rather, you know, almost an impossible task. What virtual reality, augmented reality, helps us to do was for ourselves is to understand much better how these brains are intertwined think about the treatment strategies and not only that then communicate that across continents and that's really where the power and the beauty of tech came into what we did. So how did you, you're, you're wearing VR goggles on both sides of the Atlantic presumably but you, the virtual reality can bring you into the same exactly. operating theatre in, exactly. in, a, in, a, in a sense. So how do you then start the operation and, and did you go down one avenue and then realize that was a dead end that this was going to be a, too risky and then come back or how did it work? There was, there was quite a bit of that so um, they send us all the data the CTs and the MRIs the angiograms for the children to London we put the data on our platform so we have our own virtual reality platform we wore the VR headsets here and the team in Brazil wore the VR headsets so we were all in the same virtual reality theater. And that's where we started the simulations and should we do it this way, turn the head this way, reach a dead end, as you've said, Thomas, and then come back. So we were able to refine the whole journey in quite a lot of detail before actually doing it in, in the flesh, so to say, which made the whole experience much safer for the children and much more comfortable for the clinicians uh, dealing with them. And it, after 27 hours, and we're going to have to speak up slightly because of the, the noise coming from the cafe, so you just bear that in mind. Uh, um, 27 hour operation. Uh, that was one of them. No. That's the last one. Yes. I mean, quite remarkable that, uh, that it takes that long, but clearly you had to proceed very slowly, even though you'd rehearsed the, the operation in advance. A absolutely right. So what we had expected was the surgery should have taken us somewhere around 12 to 14 hours. 
and it took us almost twice that amount of time. And that just goes to show that whilst tech has done a lot in terms of what we can do at the moment, there's a lot more to be done. Our predictions are still far from accurate. That's a really good point to, to uh, jump on to, uh, to Harris. When you're using AI uh, at Guy's and Thomas, St. Thomas's, uh, how? How are we using AI? Mm. Um, in lots of different ways. Um, uh, the main driver, of course, is the fact that we're in an under-resourced uh, healthcare system, and so there's a constant driver to, to improve our throughput, particularly with the COVID backlog. Um, and as well is to make sure that we can raise and standardize the quality of care that we're delivering. So it doesn't matter who sees you or where you're seen, you get, you're getting the best care possible. But is this in diagnostics? Are, is it, are you tra training machines to, to look at scans and yeah, spot so things that maybe the human eye can't see or what? So yeah, so that's where a lot of the work started. Um, uh, and it's less about what the human eye can't see, but helping the human eye see it quicker and more efficiently and more consistently. Um, one of the first um, examples we had at Guides to Thomas's almost a decade ago was around pediatric bone aging. So these are children, uh, we come in and we take their uh, x-ray of their hand and it's actually quite a um, relatively boring task to assess um, how well this patient is developing. Um, and often we would have large backlogs of these um, scans and that would lead to delay in care. And so we had uh, deployed an, an AI system where you would get a response within seconds and that would allow clinicians then to handle their care appropriately. We've now moved on to, um, for example, reporting head CTs from the emergency department. So somebody comes in on a Friday night, they've bumped their head and you want to know if there's blood inside, if they're bleeding and if they need any acute intervention. Um, and typically there isn't a consultant radiologist around. There is a registrar at Guy St. Thomas's, there's one radiology registrar covering Guy's Hospital, St. Thomas's and the Evelina. And so they're obviously very stretched. And um, this triage tool basically allows the, the red radiologist registrar to prioritize which scan they look at first. So we make sure that the patients that need intervention get seen a lot earlier. Uh, incredible. And let's, we'll, we'll talk about how that works in, in practice in a minute. But Peter, I mean, just explain what, what genomics is looking for. It's not looking for things like the Angelina Joni uh, gene, BRCA1, uh, which has a, a very strong risk for breast and ovarian cancer, for example. You're looking for much more subtle changes to the three billion letters uh, in the human genetic code. That's exactly right. Uh up until now in healthcare, genetics has been about changes like the Angelina Jolly mut mutation, individual changes in our DNA code which have a big impact on people. Now we've known for almost 50 years that for all of the common diseases, heart disease and diabetes and breast cancer and prostate cancer, bowel cancer, that genetics is a big part of the story about why some people are more likely to get affected than others. But we've learned that it's not one change that makes someone more likely to get heart disease or diabetes. It's many, many, many changes in our DNA. We've got three billion letters in our DNA, and there are maybe a million of those that affect how likely we are to get heart disease. And there are a different set of a million that affect how likely a woman is to get breast cancer, and another set of a million that affect how likely a man is to get prostate cancer. And so over the last couple of years, we've learned about what these changes are, and we can measure them in people. So genetics is a big part of susceptibility. Some men are 40 times more likely than others to develop pro prostate cancer just because of the DNA they've inherited. Some women are 30 times more likely than others to develop breast cancer. For uh, diabetes and heart disease, it's the same. So what's exciting and the area we focus on is that for the first time now, we can start to measure that genetic component of risk for all the common diseases. It moves genetics from an area which has focused on rare diseases and been hugely successful to actually impacting on all of the common diseases. Something like 70% of the NHS budget goes on those common diseases. And we can now learn uh, person by person for each one of us, which one of those diseases am I more likely to get? And if we do that, we can identify people who are at higher risk for those diseases who are currently completely invisible to the NHS. But the NHS has pathways. If you're at higher risk for heart disease, um, your GP will recommend um, lifestyle changes and have a conversation with you about taking statins. If you're at higher risk for breast cancer, there's a breast screening program, mammograms are offered to women and so on. So for each of these diseases, the NHS and, and healthcare systems around the world 
have pathways for people who are at higher risk. It's just that they haven't been very good at identifying who that is. So in the UK, for example, uh, all women get offered mammograms when they turn 50. NICE, the, the, the body that um, puts out clinical guidelines, recommends that women of a certain level of risk also have mammograms during their 40s. One in five women, 20% of women, fall into that group. They are completely invisible to us now and to the NHS now, whereas the technology that we're developing and, and partnering with the NHS on, that technology allows us to identify these invisible high-risk people and you can get them into prevention programs earlier, you can get them into screening programs earlier, and you can get them into treatment programs earlier. And everyone agrees that catching disease early or indeed stopping it altogether is a much, much better thing. It's better for the individuals, obviously, but it's better for the healthcare systems because it's much more expensive if you wait until disease is well developed and try and treat it than if you catch it early. So what's been the tipping point? Because I've, I've you know, been in this field for quite some time and at the very early stages, people were quite dismissive about the, the contribution these polygenic risk factors would play into the overall picture. You know, it was, a, it was a few percent. But from what you're saying now, some of them actually, when they start adding them all up, they make a, a big difference to your risk of disease. Huge, huge difference. Um, so, in, uh, so we currently estimate risk for heart disease uh, in GP's practices. They have a tool that combines your age, your sex, your blood pressure, your BMI, and so on, and estimate risk. Actually, the genetic component of risk by itself, which we've, we've just learned, Thomas, how to measure, that's what the big change has been. Um, that change by itself is about 40% of uh, the risk that we currently capture. For breast cancer, this polygenic risk, uh, the million places in, in a woman's genome, that's the single largest risk factor, indeed, if I want to predict breast cancer risk and I know only that, and you know every other risk factor that's ever been associated with breast cancer, I'll do much better than you. If you know all of those risk factors and the genetic component we can now measure, you'll do a tiny, tiny bit better than me. So for some diseases, it's the critical risk factor. It allows us to identify people much earlier in their life, before the symptoms of disease develop, in order to get them into screening programs or prevention programs. But you're finding out some really useful information. I guess when you, if I went to my GP with one of your reports, um, and they hate Dr. Google already, if I came in holding one of your reports saying, look, I've been told all these, all these letters in my, my genome put me at a higher risk of, of prostate cancer or, or, or whatever, I mean, the GP is just going to, well, I've, I've got a waiting list. It's Monday morning. I'm, I'm really busy with people who are sick. How are they going to incorporate what you're telling the NHS into, um, into their consultation? Yeah, great question. Um, and, and partly for that reason, we don't offer a report to you. We work with the GP. So we've just done a trial um, in the north of England with GPs in adding the genetic component of risk, this thing we can now measure, to the standard risk predictor they do. So we did a trial of almost 1,000 people in 12 GP practices. And it was all about checking, does this fit in with GP workloads? They are massively overstretched. The last thing they want, or indeed we want, is something that just won't work in practice. And that's what the trial was about. We measured the genetic component of risk, we fed it back to the GP, not to the patient, and the GP could use that in their conversations with the patient. The GPs loved it. 99% of people said they found it helpful, and 94% said they could understand it. So there had been a worry about how this would land on individuals. Um, and in 13% of cases, uh, one in seven or so, um, the GP changed their management, having got the extra information about the patient. So I think it's about, you're absolutely right, for this to work in practice, it has to actually fit in with workflows, and that's something we're very focused on. Harris, have you uh, come ag against resistance within the hospital to the use of artificial intelligence? Um, I wouldn't call it resistance. I think there is um, robust challenge, um, and, and I think a lot of it is relatively fair. Um, what we had, uh, say, a decade ago when we had the first sort of influx of digital health technologies and particularly AI technologies was a real lack of clinical evidence. Just because something does something cool or, or technically well doesn't mean it's useful to the patient. And, and rightly so, uh, there were a lot of misfires. And, and in fact, uh, a lot of that was inherited from mammography screening and clinical decision support systems in the early 2000s. And so we sort of learned those lessons. And there was a lot of investment in running clinical trials with AI technologies 
digital clinical trials, which we fashion them now. And, and as long as there's sufficient evidence, there's actually been quite good adoption and, and everybody recognizes the need for these tools in order to make us more productive, more safe and more clinically effective. Um, but that doesn't mean the conversation is done. It's an ongoing conversation, particularly as our ambitions in terms of what the technology could do grows. Because actually, um, what we're able to achieve with artificial intelligence is, can be quite exciting. At the moment, it's, rel it's relatively resigned to you know, restricted tasks like interpreting MRI scans or interpreting CT images. Um, but we can have end-to-end -end clinical decision making where you're integrating genetic data, imaging data, and even surgical outcomes to then decide how this patient will be cared for in the community. And then obviously to, to reach that ambition, the conversation needs to grow and become richer, not just with staff, but obviously the public. Always the, um, the, the, the operating theatre is changing quite rapidly. It's, it's not just about people huddled around a patient anymore. You often find a, a surgical robot in the corner or, or VR real, uh, uh, technology that, such as, as you use. It's becoming really smart, isn't it? Are there some people better, some surgeons who are better at uh, sticking with that change, keeping pace and, and sort of using it to its best? Uh, and, and that's an excellent question. Um, I think with, with all change, you have people that are able to adopt the change quite quickly and move on with it. But a particular issue with healthcare is at the end of the day, you know, we're dealing with people, we're dealing with people's lives. And whilst tech offers a lot of benefits in terms of how we're able to help people, it does pose a number of challenges as well. And as doctors and healthcare professionals, you need to be cognizant of that. So it's not always the right thing to do, it's not always taking the latest tech and using the latest robots. That's certainly not the case. What we need to get better at, and a lot of people have done that, is to be able to understand probability better. We have a lot more information at our hands, and certainly the patients do as well. You know, I tell this virtually to all my patients, please don't consult Google before you come and see me, and almost everybody does. It's just the way life works. So you need to start off by debunking a lot of the information they collect from Google, and then talk about the thing as it pertains to them and we've spoken about personalized element to it. So, so tech does provide that balance where there's huge gains to be made but how we adopt it particularly in sensitive areas such as healthcare does need to be managed very carefully and that's really where healthcare professionals need to understand and be trained in these techniques and understand what these challenges are. Do you think there's uh equal access to this kind of medical technology globally. I mean, for example, the, the, the twins that you successfully separated, I mean, that was only because of the charity that, that you founded, Gemini, Gemini uh, Untwined. Uh, Untwined. Um, it is a problem, isn't it? This technology doesn't come cheap. Sure. I mean, that's, that's always been the question, you know, where you've had, you've had places in the world where things are innovated and we get new discoveries and how that dissemination happens. But that question is very much a societal question. As we said, what we have, we're extremely fortunate here at Great Ormond Street, the hospital where I work, it's one of the leading children's hospitals with UCL, our academic partners. We've got the tools and technology and the people and the skill sets to do things that have not been done before. So we can innovate in terms of these complex craniopagal separations. We have computer scientists, biomechanical engineers, whole teams of these people. And as you said, it's not just doctors and nurses anymore. We really are talking about diverse teams that come together and just push the boundaries. Well, that's all well and good that you've got it here. How does that help children in other parts of the world? So for us, what we needed to do, the example we used was, we've got all these facilities in London. We needed to set up a charity that ensured that this technology and these benefits were accessible to any child and any set of parents around the globe that needed it. That very much is a question for us as a society, not just healthcare professionals. How do we ensure that what we call innovation does help the wider audience and not just a select few? Uh, you two on, on the end, I mean, the, the, uh, this probably applies to, to both of you in that artificial intelligence is only as good as the data that you put in and there have been problems in the past where uh, it, it might work in, in one group of, of patients but isn't so good at spotting um, uh, things in another and the same with, with genetics, you know, risk scores might be completely different in, in different, uh, different ethnic groups. So how do you go with the technology but not totally believe in it in all cases? So, so from our perspective it's about <laughs> building into the, the entire development life cycle 
checks and balances that, that make sure that we are not exacerbating the problems that exist in our data. Because the reality is that our data is biased, right? Healthcare and access to healthcare is biased. And what, what we don't want to do is make those problems worse by automating it and embedding that bias into a machine or into an AI. And so, for example, um, as part of the London AI Centre, which Guy Thomas is, is a founding member, we collaborate with academics and industry to develop artificial intelligence for use in healthcare. And before we um, collaborate on, on a particular project, we ask the project team to do a risk assessment about the risk of bias that their tool might produce and, and how they might mitigate that. There's also involvement from patient and public members to make sure that the proposed you know, new pathway that they're designing is one that would be amenable to, to the public. And so by building those checks and balances in and peer review allows us to mitigate it. But obviously, even once it's developed and it's out in the wild, so to speak, we need to make sure that we keep an eye on it and those things are being monitored as they're being used. Peter, briefly, just, just come back on that as well. I mean, how, how do you build uh, the risk scores to, to apply properly to everybody in the population? Yeah, great. It's a great and really, really important question. Um, broadly, the answer is the same. You make sure you check it widely. So the tool we used with GPs, um, we had validated in people of many different ancestries um, because there can be issues. We also put a lot of effort so the answer is you check it, but also we put a lot of effort into the algorithms to make sure um, that we can be as clever as possible uh, for people from parts of the world where there's currently a bit less data. And that's often the case for people outside European Perfect. populations. Has anybody got any questions that you'd like to put to the panel? It's a great opportunity. You've got three experts in the field. Um, if the, yes. In about you don't have a uh, multicultural um, samples how the, which technique do you use to make that data set balance because i guess most of the time you have an unbalance and from then you build your prediction so uh, what do you use to be able to simulate or create a up sampling or down sampling when you don't have i mean a sample of a i'm, I'm latin american for example probably in london there is not many samples of no, that, that's, a, that's a great question so there's a couple of standard techniques that you would use to enrich essentially your data set. So if there's a particular ethnicity or, or some other subgroup that is, that is underrepresented in your data, you can just enrich your data set. So you just go and find more of those people. And obviously in some cases that's not feasible. And so we're beginning to use a lot more synthetic data where essentially what we do is we learn about say South Americans and we're able to generate fake versions of that data that is representative of that population and but what it makes sure what it makes sure is that once we train an algorithm it's not biased against that underrepresented data set even when that fails there are instances where an algorithm just isn't going to perform well on a certain population and that has always happened say for example with drugs we just have to be transparent about it and be very clear that this can only be used in certain circumstances with certain safeguards in place Anybody else? Yes, gentlemen here, just wait for the mic. Yeah, just some gentlemen here. Thanks. Um, so as the sort of predictive power of AI grows, um, where would the accountability lie if there was a mistake? So would it be with the program? Would it be with the doctor? Sort of where would that accountability lie and who would take accountability? That's a great question. Uh, it's a great question. Um, one get, I get asked a lot. Um, it, almost always with the doctor, um, especially in the near term where these tools are actually acting as a decision support. Uh, they're never the final decision maker, they're always assisting the clinician in making the decision. Um, but there, there need to be checks and balances on both sides, so it's not all on the doctor's shoulder. Um, we make sure that the, the manufacturing of these tools are done in, in line with international standards and best practices and that there are ways to escalate any errors or mistakes or poor performance to the manufacturer. Um, but ultimately, you're taken care of by your doctor and, and they've got your best interest at heart. A ways to agree. Um, yes, absolutely. I think when you look at human interaction, human in interaction by and large is not contractual based. It's based on trust. And that's trust between two humans, be that a patient, a doctor, a patient and a nurse. And I think we're a long, long way away from that trust between a machine and a human. Can, can I just ask about data? 
I mean, particularly um, Peter, I mean, what happens if insurance companies get hold of the kind of information that you're able to provide about our blueprint? Yeah, and it's another really good question and, and one that comes up a lot. Um, I, I, personally, I think that would be a bad thing. And actually, I think that's an issue for society. Society can say to insurance companies, here are the rules under which you're, here's the kind of information you're allowed to use and here's the kind of information you're not allowed to use. So some years ago, we had the situation where in car insurance for young men was much more expensive than car insurance for young women because they had rather more accidents, so it sort of made sense. Uh, and then there was a change, I think, in the EU which said you couldn't discriminate. So insurers took that on board and they still offer, they used to make money on car insurance in the old world and they make money in the new world where they have to have the same premiums for young men and young women. Insurance companies can make uh, a living and, and we tell them what the rules are and I think as societies we just have to be proactive there. So in the UK for example um, it's already the case that insurers don't and can't use genetic information in setting premiums. Um, th that kind of thing I think we should in some countries it's enshrined in law, in other countries it's a code of practice. I, I think that stuff's really important but it's about society saying here's what you're allowed to use and here's what you're not allowed to use. Anybody else? Uh, trying to find, oh, there you are. Yes, over there. Hi there. Thank you for your talk. It's been really interesting. Um, a couple of questions do spring to mind, though. Uh, firstly, um, with anything with new technology, um, what you said has all been very rational and very reasoned. But let's be blunt. A lot of people are not rational or reasoned, particularly about things they don't understand. Um, particularly around technology. I think there's uh, a lot of people worried about, you know, like I've seen something I've seen in Black Mirror or Terminator. And equally as well, there is a, a lot of people can get scared about health as we've seen with the COVID pandemic. So my question really is, is that what ways can you reassure patients that they will be safe? And it's, you know, this is something that it's, you know, on one level can be answered with the head, but it also needs to be answered through the heart as well, in that sense. Who wants to take that? Sure. Healthcare as it stands at the moment and for the foreseeable future will be human to human interaction. So I think that's where the safety blanket for the patient comes from. The issue is more at our end, where as healthcare providers, we're faced with a whole lot of new technology, a whole lot of new data, new algorithms, and it's trying to decipher which are the best ways forward, which are the best. And what we need to get better at is managing probabilities. And that's where data comes in. That's where data scientists come in, in terms of guiding our algorithms. But it's an ongoing journey. Um, the focus has to be on that relationship between the doctor and the patient. I think that's historically, traditionally, been the crux of healthcare, and I think that will continue, certainly, in our lifetimes. I mean, we, we have moved very fast away from this idea of the family doctor, though. Is it, are you adamant that the machines should not get in the way of that relationship? The machines should augment that relationship, but that relationship is fundamental. Harris, I interrupted you. you no, know, that's fine. I, I was just going to add, I, I completely agree with, with what Away says, but I also think that in order to achieve the ambition that that we all have when it comes to integrating technology and, and importantly taking along the population with us, we need to change how we engage the population when we talk about innovating in the healthcare system. I think we've been really bad at being transparent historically and potentially it's because of that paternalistic approach with the family doctor and, and I think a radical transparency is going to be the only way forward because there's too much stuff happening. There's too much stuff to get educated about and informed about. Forget about the patient. For, for, for us healthcare professionals, there's, there's too many things to, to learn how to communicate. And I think we just need to be more open about the, the stuff that we've implemented, the stuff that we're evaluating, the stuff that we're researching, so that you can see that it doesn't just show up all of a sudden in your NHS app. You've actually seen it evolve from the very beginning when it was an academic idea to now as part of your postnatal checkups, for example. Uh, look. Thank you so much, all three of you. It's been absolutely fascinating to hear. Three people who are really seizing the opportunities of technology, but also 
seeing the potential pitfalls and trying to make sure that the technology is being used in the most appropriate way. So thank you very much indeed for all three.